cycles of time scale less than one day that operate here. Uh, the calculations that we have done in the first instance, they are based on um, processes integrated over 24 hours. Okay. Now, in the biological sense uh, and in the physical sense, uh, these are integrated over 24 hours. And we have reason to believe, uh, based on some fairly detailed studies of the numerical studies of this thing, that it's sufficient to uh, do that. Now, the second of your points, though, uh, is extremely important in this context. Uh, the processes with time scales of uh, a few days or more. Uh, the following week. First, the, the calculations we have done they are based on constant winds. Okay. The simplest thing you can do. But in a way, it doesn't, it's not so important what you set, how you set the wind. We set it from the atlases, but we're setting it from the act from the means. Of course, the variance is uh, absolutely critical. Now, what happens, and, and I ought to have said this when I talked about the, the spread drug thing. Spread drugs criterion said, expressing some quantitative way what the probabilities are for development of rules. So all your points are very well taken. We just have a, a other observation. Uh, we've talked about mistress here a lot. I think Harry Carter and I are the only two that do So he, he, he is well. This, uh, this is uh, 
I didn't know that you had such a close uh, regular teacher. May I say uh, that this is, um, you know, Spectra is famous not as a biologist, but um, in the biological community this work is uh, exceedingly well known, but it's only one of his contributions. The other major one, uh, you will, I don't think you will find it published in a paper, but it, it exists in the, in the textbook. And this is, excuse me, this is the, um, the global uh, map of the global distribution of prime production compared with the global distribution of the uh, sun index of physical forces. Uh, and this one is still shown in, in symposia. And, uh, so as well as his other distinguished accomplishments, uh, he's very well received in <coughs> biological and computational teachers. Uh, this depends on the uh, on there being um, enough nitrogen to support the uh, accumulation of biomass, but typically uh, uh, that would not be a, a big problem in the North Atlantic in the spring.
And because we have a mixed layer, a stable layer, there is no access for the phytoplankton to the nutrient reserves in the deep water things that are the standard situation. So we have the peculiar situation that the passage of a storm is detrimental to this whole structure, except to the extent that it stirs up the water and entrains nitrogen. So if you can find the perfect frequency of, uh, of disturbance, mm -hmm. you will always replenish the nitrogen just at the stage it's going to uh, stop the phytoplankton growth and, and therefore terminate the bloom. And this is what seems to happen in a natural way in Norway, uh, where you get the extended spring bloom uh, extends throughout the summer just because of the tuning of those uh, uh, storm pumps about once a week. So uh, it's a case, as, as, uh, as he said, of uh, the timescales are quite important. So let's uh, move on to the final speaker of the symposium, who is Dr. Curtis Ebbesmeyer. Dr. Ebbesmeyer is the senior physical oceanographer and vice president for research with the firm of Evans Hamilton in Seattle. He uh, specializes in the analysis of coastal, estuarine, climate, and large-scale oceanographic phenomena with a, a particular emphasis on understanding water movements in the Northwest Pacific. In his position with Evans Hamilton, he also directs studies for designing offshore platforms, sewage outfalls, aquaculture farms, and dredge sites. He's often called up to serve on governmental commissions. Most recently, he was appointed to the North Pacific Marine Research, Research Board and to the British Columbia State of Washington Marine Advisory uh, uh, Science Panel. He's presently working on a book about objects drifting in the ocean, and perhaps by way of preview of that book, his talk is entitled Objects Drifting the Seas, 5,000 Years BP to the Present. Thank <laughs> you. 
<laughs> this time to research when you have completed the, uh, your work. So we can reach the conclusion that there's no place uh, in the present scientific literature for a uh, short, uh, we, we think reasonably well thought of, enough for at least a paragraph to be published. So um, this is the modern earth. So um, I'd really like to start with the first drifting object, which would be drifting rocks. And uh, pumice does drift the ocean. It still does. Uh, at one point, 10% of the Indian Ocean was covered by the pumice from the Krakatoa eruption in the 1800s. Um, at some point uh, in the Earth's future, I wouldn't be surprised to see uh, a fairly a large area covered by pumice. Now, the Earth also has these um, storms. Uh, this is a uh, fairly, this is a 1970s uh, satellite a photograph. Here's from Chatka. Um, the Earth is populated by these violent storms. And in the unrecorded time, uh, a billion years ago, when we had lots of problems up to the present, when we were both humans, we still had storms. And these storms uh, were violent to the continents, and the, the storms would tear apart uh, trees and send them across the ocean. So we have lots of drifting objects. Uh, across the ocean at one time, a lot more than we have now. Um, in fact, there were floating islands of, of debris that came out of the Arctic rivers, which no longer really exist because we cleaned up our rivers. But that's another topic. Um, these kind of storms generate waves. Uh, this is a fairly tame wave of 30 feet high. This is a research vessel killing us out of the old Bureau of Commercial Fisheries. And she's heading into a wave 30 feet high. Um, fairly tame. Here's a wave taken out of Mariner's magazine. Here's a large vessel, probably 600 feet long, heading into a wave that's about 60 feet high. Still a tame, tame wave. <laughs> <laughs> Here's the same ship uh, with its bow uh, covered with that wave. And uh, this was uh, part of Picture was taken by the ship's captain. Now, for the oil industry, uh, there's been a lot of design considerations. In the North Sea and the North Pacific, uh, they designed for waves 100 feet high, twice this. So this is a still a uh, you know, modern side wave. But despite all man's accomplishments, these waves still uh, do damage. Now, this is a really nice uh, paper by Phil Richardson on um, the derelicts in the North Atlantic in the 18, late 1800s. And Phil um, carefully went through the uh, North, North Atlantic pilot charts and pulled out locations of derelict vessels. These are wooden vessels that were drifting without a crew, just drifting derelict. And you might have heard of the Plimsoll line. Um, that red line around ships. Well, it was uh, Samuel Plimsoll who uh, drew attention to the unseaworthiness of vessels in the late 1800s. A royal commission was examined, was convened to look at that, and they uh, examined uh, 280 ships, and they found 250 were unseaworthy. <laughs> and it was Plimsoll who said, paint a line around the ship so that when you load it, it is loaded correctly. About that time, there were so many unseaworthy ships that this, this uh, there were literally hundreds, perhaps thousands of ships floating in the North Atlantic that were derelict. And here, I think he had kind of 482 uh, in this period, six year period. So, in fact, there were so many derelicts that the U.S. Revenue Service was sending out cutters to sink them. And it's one of Mariner, the Mariner's worst nightmares to run across an old derelict at night in yourself in the sun. So storms are literally populated the North Atlantic at one time with derelict moving vessels. Now the Atlantic hasn't received much attention, but um, in the Pacific, about the time that you saw those um, derelict vessels, the Norwegians started using uh, glass floats to suspend their fishing nets. But the, the, the Japanese really picked it up in 1910 
and started using Japanese floats. And that may become loose. And it's estimated now that there's about 10 to 20 million Japanese glass floats <laughs> in the United States. Now, I just wanted to show you this to illustrate the great desire things about six years to go around this. Um, the great George Davidson uh, and uh, one of the Japanese consuls mapped out the derelicts in the North Pacific. Uh, there were by a friend of Catherine Plummer. She has, she has gone through the literature and pulled out a lot of stories of these vessels. What happened is off Japan, storms, typhoons, would disable a Japanese vessel. The vessel would drift offshore, would start to swamp in large waves and chop off the mast, and then they were free to drift. The trouble is, uh, it took about a year or two to drift to North America. There are hundreds of these stories of drifters across the Pacific, which is not really been pulled together except for Davidson and um, one colleague. But the work that's probably most interesting and most well known is by Betty Beggers. She's on the board of uh, directors, I believe, uh, for the, the National Geographic. Betty uh, thinks that a vessel was disabled 5,000 years ago off Japan and drifted all the way across the Pacific to Ecuador. She published this in Scientific American in 1966, and it's taken a lot of criticism for it. But there is really good oceanographic um, uh, limited to her arguments. This drift would have taken about two years. And you might, you might think that that's improbable that anybody could survive for two years on a boat, a canoe, with probably 10 people aboard. Uh, it's well documented that uh, a drift from Japan to Washington State in 1832 lasted 15 months, and there were three survivors out of 14. So one to two year drifts of people is quite feasible. But moving forward today, even though we have vessels that are 800 feet long, and there are 10 million of these 40 foot containers shipped across the world's ocean, most of the shoes on your feet probably come across the ocean these days in containers. The large waves I showed you, which have strewn the oceans with derelicts before, are still strewing the oceans with debris. Um, these large containers, as you see in the freeway, um, hold an enormous amount of material. Uh, one of these containers can hold uh, 15,000 shoes for a day. Um, it may seem trivial, but there's about a thousand containers lost worldwide every year. So there's a lot of debris being spilled. And I've been trying to persuade NOAA's marine debris program for several years now to put the material that's spilled out of these into their marine debris studies, but I have not been successful. Um, so this vessel came into Seattle, and she looked like this. This is a, a photograph out of legal files. Uh, there were this vessel had been through waves 50 feet high. She spilled 21 containers like that. And it was only really noticed um, and the damage assessed when she pulled into Seattle. The lawyers immediately hired a, heli a helicopter, flew around, and took these photographs. And this is the damage. And it's very typical. This, this part of the ships is often the most damaged. And, uh, you have, men have to go in there and unload these things. It's very, very dangerous. So uh, they started washing up on Washington's coast by the thousands. Even after a year, the shoes were lost out here. Uh, they did, according to the computer model, my friend Jim Ingram, we have the bins every day from 1946 to the present. The model simply pushes the shoes along. Uh, each comer has been reporting these by the thousands, and my mother asked me, what about these shoes? Because they were in the newspaper, and I said I didn't know. So I started phoning beach comers and getting reports. And when I had all these reports, I called Jim Ingram, who has this wonderful computer model, and I said, this is where one of the shoes was spilled. Tell me where they would come ashore and when. I won't tell you the answer. <laughs> so, this was Jim's answer, and the first recoveries were right here. So he was off by about 10% time and space. But we published this result in Helios, uh, and we never, that was his result over the phone and over the facts. We didn't have to change it at all. So 
This model does very well, and it's a your station pop up. And this is a just normal diffusion. There's not much diffusion in the ocean, and when the shoes get to shore, they wash up and down. They arrived, uh, they were still in May, and they arrived here in the winter time. And some of the storms burst into the north, and then uh, in summer the shoes got pushed back to the south in the summer months. Uh, these shoes are so wearable after being in the water for 10 months to a year that people were actually paying an artist trying to buy who collects them here. And Steve McLeod collected, I think, 300 pairs, matched, washed, and uh, they're selling for $30 a pair. <laughs> so, if you go to Steve McLeod, he's well known, well known wearing an artist. His apartment had racks and racks of shoes. <laughs> but what it, what it taught me was that modern technology um, is so good that the paint is not uh, on the shoes, it's not paint, they're wearable incredibly durable, and uh, Nike wouldn't pay me anything for an advertising <laughs> I asked them, they said, it's, it's not a sports attribute we wish to endorse. <laughs> <laughs> so, I never made a penny, I never got any funding for this, so I probably hold it, but. Uh, this is Jim Ingram's um, sea surface pressure. This is a photograph of his computer screen. Here's a low pressure. Here's where the shoes are still, that's a <laughs> six months apart. And uh, you can see that the winds are swirling around. And um, the idea is that the winds push too much to shore. Here's Hawaii. Here's Vancouver and Washington. You get the idea. This is what Jim's computer screen looks like. You can do this uh, every day since 1946. So if you've got something floating in the ocean, you can put it in his model. And, uh, so I used to not like the media, but I learned to love the media through this story. Uh, for example, the shoes would wash up, and this is out of scientific America. That's what our shoe looks like on the beach. And the media loved the story, and that was the only contact I had with beachcombers. So I always said, if you're a beachcomber and you find a shoe, write to me. And the media was um, how that message got out. <laughs> so that was Boris Meinkamp. He put that story together. And the point is, the media is the only is the only way that oceanographers have really good connection with beach I, mean, I was at Fermi Lab a couple of weeks ago talking, and uh, you know, I said, when we get a supernova, we have amateurs, and they tell us to go look. And you know, the policy at the Field Museum, they said, you know, we got dinosaurs, we got amateurs digging up dinosaur bones. And then they call us and we go excavate. And I said, yeah, well, the beach numbers come into an oceanographic laboratory, nothing happens. <laughs> so, so what I'm trying to do through all this is get beach numbers to write. And then we'll find interesting things and we can do better oceanography. So that's part of what I'm doing. And the media is. Uh, well, here's the New York Times. Uh, Walter Sullivan. Uh, <laughs> this is how the dean of science writers, Walter Sullivan, kind of viewed uh, an oceanographer. The <laughs> <laughs> ocean's full of shoes, and we even got satellite oceanography. <laughs> so, anyway. Um, yeah. On the ocean are an awful lot of messages. I don't know where the Columbus put a barrel out with this farewell in it to the Queen. And it was worth, he said it probably worth a thousand ducats, which is about fifty thousand dollars today. But there are many ship captains, and one of my friends is Basil Biggs, and he drives big thousand-foot boats around the ocean. And this is one of Basil's bottles, and in the bottle he puts one of his owners comes aboard, owners drink the wine. Basil takes the bottle on his typewriter, he puts his little wheel in, and throws it overboard. And Basil has thrown bottles all over the world. And he sent me his scrapbook, and there's wealth of information. And one of the things I'm trying to do is, is to renew the connection with ship captains. And that's one of the bottles. Another bottle, I happen to be having a lunch with a friend, um, uh, Richard Strickland, and Richard's a science writer. A wonderful book. And 
And I found this note on my desk about all these toys that were washing up in Alaska. And somebody said, well, what are these? And I, so I started digging into it, and lo and behold, a container fell overboard in the middle of the Pacific and spilled 29,000 rubber ducky frogs and turtles. <laughs> And Jim Ingram's model showed that the turtles, ducks, beavers, and frogs wandered right by the site where the shoes had been spilled. <laughs> Not only that, they wandered right by Station Papa. So that's time to me like to make a grand tour in the uh, planetary sense. So these are the little critters, and uh, they're very buoyant. They're kind of hyper particles in the ocean. The winds blow them extremely fast. They cross half the ocean in half the time that the shoes did. So extremely fast, very, very, uh, very quick. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> uh, there's a lot of technology behind these toys. <laughs> you know how many of you have children? You ever hear of Keith Barry, Barry Brailton? Anyway, he's a famous child psychologist or something like that. So this company, Kitty Products, hired him to design these toys. And so uh, Brazelton said, well, make the machine washable so that when the next team gets in the tub, he doesn't have the germs from previous previous little time. So they put these toys through 52 machine washings to make sure that they float. <laughs> <laughs> so these, these toys are really very durable. I took them uh, 10 months to cross two-thirds of the Pacific Ocean. <laughs> and when they arrived on shore, they were still usable. Uh, people loved them. And uh, this is what Jim's computer model said. And again, this is a photograph of Jim's screen. Okay, they were spilled here. And they wandered. The different colors are 20, there's 25 colors in here. Jim put 25 toys. They were spilled here in January, and by uh, Thanksgiving they were here at Sitka, where the newspapers went nuts. And then uh, they went around here to build the Alaska Gyre. They got up the intermac crafts and they kind of started exploding. Some are going to go across over to Kamchatka, some are going back around the gyre, and some will be going to Japan. This is two years, three years later, in the same computer run. I showed you before, it's they stopped about here. This is what happens after three years. You might say, well, so what? We actually had a lot of reports from here. So we, we had, we had uh, changed the calibration coefficients of the shoes from the toys to account for the high wind from here to here. With those same coefficients, we looked at all run for three years. Some got to Japan, some are up to Kamchatka, some are heading to the various straight. Some came back to Washington Coast, theoretically. Theoretically. So I'm not a theoretician. I always call it hero when I have a nasty uh, theoretical problem. So Jim let this model run. And lo and behold, these were due in November of last year. We got two reports of the uh, Trumper on the beach. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, there's some, some small little calibration of even over a time scale of years, a model was just simply winds pushing things along the ocean. It did pretty well. So people who are studying drifting logs with animals growing, biogeographers can use this model to push living organisms around the ocean. So, uh, so this is what the New York Times do. They, uh, they, this is how they visualize the storm sinking the ship. Or, how the New York Times visualizes the mass science. Mm -hmm. Here are the rubber duckies snowing the ocean going up into the Bering Strait. Uh, I told them that we get caught in Arctic ice and they will get close to the transpolar drift and come out over the North Atlantic and uh, they'll wind up with one bridge. This is how the New York Times treated it. And uh, Scholastic News came in and took a picture of yours truly and Jim Ingram. He's got a frog on his head. Here you know, I have uh, different ducks and things. And, um, this, went to, this story went to a lot of kids. And, uh, but I like it because it's the best picture I had. Um, 
where the toys went. They started in the middle of the Pacific, of Pacific Alaska, down the Aleutian Islands, through the Bering Strait. <coughs> carried them across the North Pole, they'd wind up in the North Atlantic, and some might even get back to New York City. So, so it kind of gives, a kid, gives kids a, a, a good idea of what's possible. Now, that, that's interesting. And then, uh, uh, people magazine. <laughs> Okay, well, I, I, that concludes the, uh, the uh, talks, and I want to thank all of the speakers for the very interesting and stimulating presentations and the, the time that you took to, to prepare. I um, really appreciate it, and I think we've all enjoyed your presentations very much. Uh, we're going to break for lunch. Uh, before we do so, though, Akira, would you, you will have the, the last word, certainly, at lunch. Would you like to say anything right now? Uh, but you'd like to wait, okay? <laughs> okay. Um, in that case, then, uh, lunch is, is set up outside this room. I suggest we, we take a break, help yourself, serve yourself lunch, and then bring it back in here, and we'll have some additional uh, presentations. In.
Jones. I just wanted to wish you a happy retirement. It's been a pleasure knowing you, and you're by far the nicest person I've ever met. So good luck, and I'm going to do a little uh, walk around the center so you have something to remember us by. Beautiful day today. It's about 90 degrees out. The 22nd of July, Here. And now we're down by your office. 
little messy down here but definitely had to get the poster this is great poster this is you when you were a young lad coming into your office so you can remember how this looks. There's so many things in here. Lots of papers. Enormous amounts of books. The view from your window. Or should I say the view of the fire hydrant? Gee, Kakira, I never knew you had a view of that fire hydrant. I would have uh, covered that up for you. Go back out and head back down to hear the remarks from everyone after they have eaten their lunch. And one more thing, the other side of your office. Okay, see you down in the seminar room. Thing is the main office that you've frequented so many times. And the super secretary, Gina Garten who always helps you out, waving to you. She's on the phone. She can't talk to you right now. And Kirk's office. I hope this is not making you too dizzy watching this. Not too familiar with this camera. But at least you'll have something to remember. Old Marine Science is by. Hi, Kira. OK, we're going to the seminar. A symposium. I send my best wishes and my congratulations for your long and productive career. I know I speak for all present when I affirm how much your friendship has enriched my professional and personal life. With best wishes now. I thought we might start with uh, Don Pritchard, who was uh, Akira's um, thesis advisor. And uh, Don, I know, has some some very interesting stories about uh, Akira as a student, and we uh, would all enjoy hearing those. So Don, could I turn it over to you? I won't take very long. But, uh, I was interested to, to, to note that uh, a couple of times uh, during the presentation, uh, there were uh, references to work that Kira had done uh, during that time period when we were working closely, closely together, and and even after that time, but when uh, he was doing work related to my specialty, uh, John Steele presented a diagram showing a variants of a dispersing patch, uh, point source, a patch uh, versus time on a long scale, and uh, that, that fit a straight line, uh, which was really the summation of the, a lot of work we had done together. And then uh, Mimi told and showed a diagram that Kira gave her from an experiment that Harry Carter actually was the primary, the principal investigator on. I participated in, and uh, some others here, I think, got involved in going out uh, just off the south shore of Bone Island here is where we conducted that experiment involved a buoy uh, containing a, dye, a barrel of dye and a feeder and pump so that we had a plume from a point source continuous release, a series of instantaneous releases of die, and uh, the drifter uh, experiment, which was show, shown how the two-dimensional drifts uh, differ from the three-dimensional three deployment, or at least the, that three-dimensional uh, discharge of a traceable material, which is confined just by the surface but otherwise So with that, I, I would like to comment on a few instances that 
I know uh, many of you uh, know that uh, Kara came to Japan for the job at the University to study, and uh, I think it was, well, I should start by saying in the late 59, uh, 50s, and I don't remember exactly the time I received a letter from Japan, and I think it was a, a, a Japanese uh, Atomic Energy Agency saying that they had a, a chemist in, in working for the uh, uh, Japanese Meteorological and Oceanographic Office uh, who was in charge of their chemical oceanography department uh, that wanted to come and study in the United States uh, in, indicating problems associated with the radioactive waste disposal in the ocean. I had uh, been involved in that for some time and there was a paper that accompanied that letter that Kira had written, on which he used rhodamine the uh, dye patched, and uh, uh, he, he did not use the fluorescent quality for the dye, he used the absorption characteristics of the dye to study dispersion. And since Jim Carpenter and I have been for several years developing a technique or using the fluorescent characteristics of the, the rhodamine family of dyes uh, in studying uh, directly measuring uh, dispersion in the ocean. This was interesting to me, but I thought, well, he's a chemist, he'll probably want to work with Dave Carrot, who was a chemist. And then sometime in 1959, this uh, very uh, straight standing angular gentleman, uh, thin uh, gentleman that showed up in my office. And he was uh, carrying a little book. And uh, I uh, started to talk to him, and I had his file before me, and uh, I asked him if he had uh, contacted Dave Carrot yet. And he sort of fumbled, he didn't answer it sort of slumming through the little book that turned out to be a dictionary. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, he, did, he wouldn't answer me. And I said, well, uh, Dave Carrick's our, our, Carrick's our, our chemist, and uh, you should get together with him and planning your curriculum. What you're going to say. Well, he kept pretending he didn't understand. <laughs> <laughs> Exactly right. <laughs> and, 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 you know, uh, I can't say no. No, I never heard the word no. come out. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. no, they never say it. They say So that was the end of this. I don't you know, know whether the word that exists, but it's not pronounced. <laughs> <laughs> I'm not sure, but he did before. <laughs> <laughs> he came to me as a technical I realized later that Akira was just really a frustrating no, 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 no. He kept looking for ways to apply his mathematics. And he would get tired in one field. Uh, I don't know whether chemistry just didn't satisfy that need. So I was working on the diffusion at the time, dispersion process. So that's what he got involved in. That's, uh, it wasn't very long before he be passed my uh, abilities in that field and uh, became what I considered to be the plural authority on the fusion of the ocean. Uh, he got his degree then in 1963, so not very many. Uh, not an unusual length of time for in the marine field. And, uh, Stayed at the Chesapeake Bay Institute. And that was a period when uh, funding was quite different. Uh, we, uh, we got institutional funding, essentially. Uh, our vessel was a unit vessel, and, uh, even though it was the smallest one in the fleet. And, uh, and we had uh, primarily our support came from the Office of Naval Research. For a while there, but 70% of all oceanography in the country was supported by ONR. Uh, and uh, from 
support from, from AEC and build up over that time, and then I had state support. But I essentially wrote most of the proposals myself that were for Minia. So one proposal would go to an agency, and uh, so Karen was supported under that so broad base of the funding. And probably at, at that period, uh, there was maybe Dave Karen got maybe that most of it was support that I got. And uh, we had a very fruitful relationship with, in developing uh, uh, results of research on the fusion version and the like. And then uh, you might have noted that Harry Carter was tied to someone else who got through with the largest number of co-authorships with Nakira. But that covered the, this era later. Then sometime later, and I can't pick the time, but it's in the late 60s, I guess. Sometime in the 60s, Akira came to me and said, I want to become a biologist. <laughs> I said, well, I, yeah, that's, that's interesting. What do you want to do? <laughs> I want to study the counteraction of the biological attraction versus the physical dispersion of midges. <laughs> I waited for a while. I didn't quite know what to say, but I said, well, Sarah. <laughs> We're an oceanographic <laughs> <laughs> uh, Couldn't you work on, on schools of fish? <laughs> Zooplankton? Some, something in the ocean? <laughs> I don't have a spot for you. No. <laughs> the way to go is to study myths. I don't, uh, he somehow he got contaminated by the people. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, I said, well, we'll do what we can. I bootlegged the cure for three years. And, I mean, and, and finally, uh, the word came down, <laughs> we can't support this anymore. And we had to finally write some reports, you know, on what people were doing. <laughs> After three years, uh, we had to admit the truth. And, uh, <laughs> so we were, I think, when, Kara, when, when was that? 72? Huh? 74. 74. 74. So it might have been a little more than three years. But <laughs> <laughs> I think it was. It was like four or five years. <laughs> So Akira went off to the hinterlands, and I was really, you know, we all worried about him. He walked across the country, I think, uh, and uh, went up to Seattle. What's that? I went to Seattle. Yes. Well, he went, he went to Seattle, the road show, and so on around and contact. But we all were worried because we didn't ever hear of any employment record, and I guess he got a little support here and there, but. Uh, in any case, uh, Jerry Schubel, another one of my students, <laughs> who was very, very close to Kara, uh, bailed him out. I was happy to hear that one of you was about to make an offer to him. I mean, uh, it was a uh, foul, I guess. Yeah, you were. Yeah. I hold you personally responsible for not being able to. Do yeah, you did it move soon enough. <laughs> <laughs> but uh, in any case, uh, he, was, he was brought here all, much to uh, uh, our gain. And uh, I, I, I do want to reiterate my pleasure at being here uh, on this occasion, and but more so to say what a wonderful relationship I've had in here over many, many years. Thanks for all coming.
Simon, <coughs> Lynn had a letter uh, from a colleague of the Cure, and would like to read it. I think uh, Doug's remarks about not knowing what a Cure is first career really was, <laughs> I uh, am reminded of one of my pet theories, which is that we all know little pieces of the cure. We all, uh, I'm constantly discovering important things about him that I never knew before, and realizing I know important things about him other people don't know, and I think this is the cure's grand strategy, which is to tell each one of us little pieces so we'll have to come together and talk about it. <laughs> it's a cozy of the sort, you can see <laughs> that, his, uh, that his plan has worked out. Uh, <laughs> This is from um, uh, Hide Yamazaki at the Tokyo University of Fisheries, who writes, uh, I have received notice of the special symposium for Akira Kubo. It's a wonderful plan. I wish I had the time and the money to attend the lectures. I have a great respect for his work and personality. I think we all do. Please pass the following message on to him when you present his introduction, if it is possible and appropriate. Professor Okubo has inspired many researchers in the area of physics and biology uh, and, and their coupling. I'm honored to be one of them. When, when I was in my senior year, I came across two books which eventually brought my career in terms of biophysical couplings uh, into focus. One of them was Wind Waves by B. Kinsman, and the other was Diffusion and Ecological Problems, Mathematical Models by Professor Okubo. They were both in Japanese. The one by Kinsman was translated by Professor Okubo. <laughs> I would have been in a different life without these two books. I appreciate you, Akira, and your works, and I would like to congratulate you on this special symposium. Now, I could just take a, a, a minute more. I, I have two uh, tiny uh, typical stories of Akira that I'd like to relate. Uh, one relates to uh, that Akira doesn't know I know this story, uh, to a, a rabbit we used to have. We had a pet rabbit, Bugs, for nine years. And when Akira would come to our house, uh, he would lie on the floor talking to Bugs. And my wife, Carol, came in one day and heard him whispering to Bugs, saying, don't tell Carol, I'm going to steal you. <laughs> Told us. <laughs> and, and, and the other, the other story uh, was I, I, I see him wearing this uh, wonderful uh, suit, and uh, I, I mentioned that at my 50th birthday, um, uh, I also received the suit from uh, Amy and Nanako, and it had something in it you know, written in Japanese. And uh, Akira was at the, my 50th birthday party where I was given this suit, and I said, Akira, could you tell us what it says in here? And his eyes were so large as he looked at the suit. And he looked at the, what it said in Japanese, and he said, it says, for Akira. <laughs> to occur yesterday. We, there's one uh, very important presentation that uh, we didn't make yesterday, and Kurt Ebersmeyer has that to make now. Well, I, I have a, a, a few a few Akira stories, which you, I'm sure none of you know. And uh, <laughs> but, uh, Akira has, uh, what I've always admired is he always loved, always loves young people. And regardless of where I've been with the cure, he's always had young people around doing really interesting things. And so when I was in the midst of difficulties in my PhD program, I was working for a mobile oil corporation. And I was having trouble with these equations. And so I was in my office in downtown, downtown Manhattan, and uh, I called the cure up. This name on this paper that I had unearthed. And I'd never met him before. So I called the cure and this voice I could hardly hear on the telephone says, interesting, interesting, I'll, I'll think about that. And uh, 
Two days later, he showed up in my office. <laughs> could not uh, believe it. And then uh, a couple of years later, one letter helped me uh, to graduate. And, and if it wasn't for Akira, I uh, wouldn't uh, have done, uh, wouldn't be in oceanography. So he, he really gave me my life in oceanography. Um, there's a few, a few things that, um, a few things. Uh, when he visits, he's made something like 48 trips to Seattle, I think. He counts. He counts wherever he goes. <laughs> like, not listen, <laughs> so uh, one time, uh, um, Susie, my wife, and we were, uh, we saw him off at lunch, and he was going to campus, and he was going to pet his pet squirrels, and uh, he likes to he liked to go to the upper campus on the University of Washington and play with the squirrels. I mean, literally, he would sit there and hold peanuts, and they would crawl all over a carrot. <laughs> and these are large. Gray Manhattan type squirrels. <laughs> and if you know those type of squirrels, um, they have their personality. So Akira came back for dinner and uh, we noticed that uh, all of his fingers were bandaged. <laughs> well, I mean, all, he had the tiny little bandages all over his hand. <laughs> he had forgotten to bring enough peanuts. <laughs> and they were, they were mad. So that's, uh, <laughs> and, um, Akira loves, loves small animals. One time he came to the house and uh, uh, we, I had a puzzle that had 50 cats and a thousand little pieces of crossword puzzle. And it was Akira had to leave the next morning or something like that. So we, on a plane, so we were up until I, we, we got, uh, oh, this puzzle was unique. It was on, printed on both sides. And the, one side was rotated 90 degrees with respect to the other. Oh, yes. Well, if you know Akira, he, ha he has a, a, a passion for puzzles. So at midnight, we got down, we had about 600 pieces done. By 3 o'clock in the morning, we were down to two or 300 pieces. By 5 o'clock, we had 10. We were up till about 6 a, 7 a.m., and then we had to go catch his plane. He so, loves crossword puzzles. <laughs> now, I'll just wind up with uh, one, one final little story, then I'll make a presentation. You, you might recall um, Akira's um, office when he had Chiu and Chiba two pet dribbles in his office. And Kara and I would talk endlessly about forecasting weather according to where the burrows were in his little aquarium for dribbles. And Kara had very, very definite theories on weather prediction and dribble patterns. And when Chiu and Shiba died, it was a sad time. And, and, uh, so uh, out of recognition for uh, uh, Kara's um, love of small animals, I brought some, some, uh, some replacements. And a A couple of years went by, and then I was at the Aswell meetings in, at the University of Washington, the hinterlands, <laughs> and it was during the plankton uh, presentations. 
And somebody stood up behind me to ask a question. This small man stood up <clears throat> and said, my name is Akira Okubo. And I turned around, and, and here was a friend of Maxwell's demon right there. And he asked some questions. And afterwards, I wanted to run up to you to, to find out more. And of course, I was blocked off by Tom Powell, who was right in front of me. <laughs> <laughs> grabbed the cure, and they pulled off to lunch together. So I missed him at that moment. But Curtis Evansmeyer and I, <clears throat> we, uh, we were friends. And Curtis had known Akira in New York. So through Curtis, I met Akira, and that began a series of wonderful adventures. And some of them are quite notable. And I'd like to describe a couple of them because it will give you another flavor that we often don't talk about of Akira, but it's, we all know it's there. And when we first met, Curtis and Akira and I went up to the Blue Moon Tavern. Now, those of you which have been to the Blue Moon in Seattle know something about this. It's a place where bums, uh, bikers, poets, and professors go. It's <laughs> a mile from campus, and that was as far, as close as you could get to the campus for many years, the bar. So we went up there. There's a sign that says, sorry, we're open when you go in, and there's a lady sitting on a Blue Moon that extends out over into the sidewalk. And we talked about science there several hours, and then it became known that uh, we all liked Beethoven, so we went over to my house, and we decided we would listen to some Beethoven, and I had all my symphonies in a big box that used to come in the vinyl. So we put on the first symphony, and we listened to that. And we, being an orderly person, Akira suggested that we, that we listen to all of them. <laughs> and another one of his characteristics, he has impulses which he becomes very stubborn and complete. <laughs> so we listened that night to all nine Beethoven symphonies way into the morning. And at sunrise, I think we finally finished with the chorus of the ninth symphony. And we were very happy it was over. <laughs> <laughs> but that brought out one of his characteristics. And that is, of course, is that you're very stubborn <laughs> and very impulsive sometimes. And it was at a, a birthday party when another very interesting event happened. It was my 30th birthday party. And my sister had given me some ginseng. And Akira saw that. He'd come with Donna Ben Diener as his date, a good friend of all of ours. And he saw that. And his eyes got big like this. He grabbed the ball out of my hand, held it in both hands, took the cap off, and tried to swallow it. And tried to swallow it giving him all this, this, this vitality that he wanted at that moment. <laughs> <laughs> well, nothing up. <laughs> and we were also drinking wine out of gallon jugs that night, and holding it like this. And Akira took the gallon jug, and he tried to do, as he did with Beethoven's Nine Symphonies, <laughs> Donna ran up and grabbed the bottle out of his hand because he was trying to finish it all in one, in one gulp. <laughs> I, I, I guess the point being that there are several sides to Akira. <laughs> uh, just a couple more elements to this. He decided, of course, later on that he wanted to, to walk across the country. And he was going to start in Seattle and, and walk in small segments. Well, he wasn't really in condition to, to walk when he first started. So he went uh, to Everett, which is about 15 miles north of town on a bus. And then he walked into the Cascades part of the way, and then he decided he had to walk back. Well, on the way back, he was getting very tired, and his legs were cramping up. So the final distance, about the final half mile or so, walking to the bus station, the only way he could move was backwards. So here is this, this Japanese man walking backwards onto the bus to go down the street. <laughs> <laughs> <Just> slightly <laughs> embarrassed, and I'm not sure what the other people felt. <laughs> Well, those are those are our three important events. There is a realm of science also that is. He sent me a paper as, as Tom pointed out. There are we've all received these well these handwritten treaties on some subject, and one of his subjects, of course, is spawning. He's very interested in spawning. And then we once, I think, in maybe in the blue moon or someplace like that, we were discussing. Uh, human spawning, and particularly sperm dynamics. And so he sent me a paper 
of mathematical analysis of this. And he had taken a one-dimensional convection diffusion equation, uh, the x-axis being along a dimension of interest. <laughs> <laughs> and he had put into it a diffusion component and an advection component. And the advection component had, had a mean velocity and an oscillatory velocity. <laughs> I don't know how to really say this. <laughs> and then he looked at the significance of the significant event happening as a function of the amplitude of the oscillatory velocity. <laughs> he then informed me on this paper that he was going to present these results at the International Conference on Pornography. In <laughs> So I imagine that he was down there in Times Square on New Year's Eve with the sandwich board with a poster session on the front describing the evolutionary significance of oscillatory velocities in one dimensional systems. <laughs> well, actually, my paper was not down. It was. Because <laughs> no data. <laughs> there are some statements we, that we've all had with Kira. Some things he said, and you've been in the room or in a group when he's turned and said, do you have data? And then he will then create a paper on your data. And, and I think there are many of us here which have, have been directed to, he's explained things to us. So we, have, we see this complicated mass, and Kira, Kira will look at it, and it simplifies into some beautiful... Uh, a crane, a paper crane, like the type he's often to make while sitting in a bar talking to people and you know, present you with something. Well, so I guess you never, you never did ask me if I had data on that. <laughs> <laughs> another statement he makes, uh, he says sometimes, this is a very difficult problem. And when he says that, you know that it is a very difficult problem. <laughs> so I, I think I'll, this ends my report on his experiences in the hinterland. And I want to thank you for being my mentor. And I think that usually the whole is greater than some of the parts. But I think in your case, you are the part which is greater than the whole. And we, I, I think I thank you and probably everybody else for, for the contributions that you've made in simplifying things for us and in providing more than a science but an integrity as a person. those who said they wanted to say a few words. Don, did you? Yeah, I, I just thought there, had, there was a, a career that I don't know how far Kira got into, but uh, that hasn't been mentioned here. And that was, I think it was 10 years or so ago. Uh, Kira announced to Kira Schubel and I that he wanted to go into a new career. He wanted to study American Where did that go? <laughs> <laughs> Maybe on that note, I will turn it over to Akira. <laughs> <laughs> well, yes, I remember. I said that. So, um, so actually, I went to the library to look for the um, little chapter books, and I was so depressed because because shelves and the shelves were nothing but book of mechanism. So I said, well, this is not. <laughs> so, so, um, so I wrote a book, books and reading, but um, I realized maybe nothing I could do. Until very recently, when I met, um, a few years ago, when I met um, Curtis Abismayan in Seattle, maybe that was 1939 Street or something. Then he showed me some, um, including the uh, pictures he showed, he showed uh, presented. Uh, he showed me a, um, a bunch of that kind of uh, hydrograph office, some kind of chart, and a point 
lot of points, many, many points. And the date is And Kazi uh, says this is a, um, this is actually, he's talking about a mine, mine in uh, 1946. What happened is that to the end of the Second World War, um, before the uh, Japanese defeat, uh, American, American Navy and American Air Force put the uh, more on the mine to shield the country completely. So something like all our 50,000. So they, so the all of Japan, on the coast, is uh, just filled by, by black ball, black dots, and where the uh, mines are dropped. And the uh, Pacific side, they use the ship um, or submarine to, uh, to drop the, uh, the mines, but uh, no, uh, Japan seaside, they mostly use, use the B, B29 to drop. So then I recall I that when I was in Japan, I was a um, freshman, the incredible thing I, I mentioned to uh, yeah, the yesterday, but um, Japan, they are all the students in science, and engineer, engineering got deferment until graduation. So unlike any other country. So they, they uh, somehow they deserve the, uh, those future scientists and uh, engineers. And I, I still, nobody knows who designed this, who had, who had this idea. But my impression is some guy, some guy could see the future. Um, Japan will be defeated. And the only way Japan to survive is Japan has no natural resources. To import natural resources and to make good product to sell in the world, that's the only way Japan to survive. So to, to do this, we must save the future generation of scientists and engineers. I think somebody saw the future. But anyway, I was fortunately <laughs> in the science area, um, yeah, so um, I didn't go to the war. Also, I got phys physics and physical examination uh, 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 passed. So, so the, um, when I got physical passed, then I expected to be drafted in that because, because the announcement, the special announcement, the department came a couple months later. Anyway, that's the story. Then, um, then then toward the end of the war, I was in Japan, and the uh, American B-29 B came almost every day, bombing, but sometimes they came one, one or two, and they drove, they didn't do anything. They just passed in Japan, uh, Tokyo, and the campus. Almost every, every day. Now I realize they dropped <laughs> mine. <laughs> Japan coast, Japanese, uh, Japan sea coast. But anyway, about all our 50,000 mines completely shared to Japan. That's the reason why last, uh, especially the last few, few months before the end of the war, all of us stopped. Nothing came from China, nothing came from Korea. A lot of we imported from those countries. So I think apparently all, all the ships are sunk. Anyway, after the war, and the, um, that summer, we had a tremendous number of big hurricane storms, hurricane typhoon, and about uh, maybe about thirty percent of, of the morning <coughs> moored mine was released. So tremendous number of, of, of mines are floating from Japan to America. <laughs> <laughs> and uh, I remember at that time that I was reading. <laughs> Battleship is appropriate position to 
system. So those who are fishermen sport just grown up in instantaneous, so didn't have any time to send this race. Anyway, then I think it's American maybe realize that it's a very danger in <laughs> Pacific. So um, so Curtis told me that um, next year, so 1964, the entire Pacific fleet <laughs> used to search and destroy the <laughs> mine. So, the, so the, the, then the other records, uh, the hydrograph office, office charts show that where they found the mine and destroyed So then, how is profit the um, number of um, Say every five degrees or so, starting with Japan, Japanese coast of America, number of mines destroyed and floated against sea my rock with a beautiful, beautiful feature, twenty some point. So that means exponential decay. So um, so then that is under I sub deducted. Is there any kind of simple model to explain this? <laughs> so, so then, our idea is since they, they did a survey uh, north of 40 degrees and south of 20 degrees, only 30 degrees done, so some, some of the mind must have missed the diffuse beyond CTV. So that uh, we, can, uh, we can model as a simple exponential decay with diffusion constant and width, width of the area. And the other loss is due to random deaths, because just random search and destroys. So we hit the um, curve, semi log then coefficient, are com are composed of, of diffusion loss and shooting loss. So <laughs> and uh, we got some success, but uh, Curtis is still looking for more data. <laughs> he believed they must have another data. So we're just waiting. We are just waiting to um, get some kind of data. And that's so then during this process, Curtis uh, and I uh, figured out how many drifting objects, including log and shifts, anything. Any. In a Pacific Ocean at a certain time. And the cuts figured out at least a million And it's more than one meter. Then I, I, um, I, did, a, I did an article. This is a true story. This is the cuts mentioned too. It's in the 18, early 18th century, 18th century, or the three fishermen survived. They went to fish fishing in a shipwreck and they drifted from Japan to America, landed, escaped fractally, fractally of Washington State. And at uh, that time, they were rescued by American Indian. And finally, they um, transported into, into, uh, into American companies. And then finally, they returned to Japan. Actually, they couldn't return to Japan because those days, Japan closed her country. And no Japanese could allow to return. And excuse me. And so, um, so the three poor men actually couldn't return to Japan and died. So nice. But anyway, then, then I thought, well, this is, this is it. I could study as an oceanographer. Because a lot of floating objects must have come from Japan to America. We cross you all the pressure extension. And this is a shipwreck. It's a, it's a Japanese traditional ship made of wood, of course, that, that passed together by name. It's an iron man. And the interesting thing is when, as far as I, I know, I, I read uh, many, many books. Like American Indian didn't have any method to, to harvest iron. Nevertheless, the interesting is only if you tried in the other coast of Washington, Washington State, there is the evidence that they used iron metal to make, make, uh, make the arrow point or something else. Also, they, they didn't produce iron. So, so my theory is that they, they must have picked up shipwreck or some kind of rock 
with with iron um, cost of, of machine make uh, make um, the um, weapon. So that's probably only one, but <laughs> but make something else. It's um, it's possible that um, all the material come from Japan or China arrived to, to the American coast and Japanese I mean and Indian must might have used it. So this is something I I could contribute <laughs> to So that's a uh, it's a very very minor minor aspect but um, so that, that's kind of thing I would like to explore in future. And uh, as I mentioned yesterday I have been now uh, very much interested in floating object because it's, it's, it's already started but uh, I'm going to collaborate with you and uh, I'd like to study uh, the uh, ecological aspect that, uh, what kind of microcosmos ecosystem developed around the uh, floating object like wood and then this might be very important purpose I mean, mechanism of transport of species <coughs> and that um, trans trans oceanic disposal. So that kind of thing I like to study in the future. And uh, talking about the the um, the preacher comment I have a lot of story about it. But um, one thing I like to mention is that uh, uh, well, anyway, um, in the whole, and the people have really helped me to figure out my career. And a couple of things I like to mention is one is um, when I arrived in America, uh, next day I went to his office and uh, introduced myself, talking a little bit, and he said, uh, Oh, you don't speak English. <laughs> 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 and uh, and because before that we communicated by letter. And uh, the teacher said, uh, um, you are, your letter I understand, but you can speak. <laughs> <laughs> so I think uh, yeah. European or American, if a person can write, Immediately assume that you speak, not not for Japanese. And we learn the English um, um, starting at uh, junior high school, writing, grammar, composition. No, 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 no speak. No conversation because teachers cannot speak. <laughs> <laughs> so, so that's why um, most Japanese cannot speak English. And this way they started ground. So when I arrived here, I was not only like a thank you, bye bye or something, very few us. <laughs> <laughs> so, so what happened is uh, when I went to become a student, um, I went to the American Embassy in Japan in Tokyo to have a um, language test. And I passed, I barely passed the written, but uh, when it comes to conversation, I failed. So then the um, examiner said, you cannot go to Japanese because your English is not good enough. You cannot attend the class. So that is. So his report said, I cannot go. But, but, um, in my, but I had a fellowship from the Japanese government. And uh, uh, all the communicated with Dr. Pichat. And Dr. Pichat said, we will take you, take you as a student. So, so I, I just caught between. <laughs>
Really save me. <laughs> and all, but fortunately, I passed. So that was a um, yeah, lot, of, lot of story about uh, my advisor. And another thing is uh, um, when I was writing, uh, studying the oceanic diffusion diagram, and uh, he really helped me a lot. So I wanted to ask him, I wanted to ask him to go. Oceanography, but could be used. Your result could be used for zooplankton. So, 
but don't spend more than a quarter of time. <laughs> you have another thing. Randomly <laughs> saying, I spend a lot of time. <laughs> In two years. <laughs> so I finally had an agent leave. So I went to, I packed and went to Seattle. No job. He started some kind of very, very safe job, but that was not good. So I struggled uh, about eight months. No, no money. Unfortunately, I think the teacher arranged me to give me uh, some, some uh, combating the um, sabbat, uh, no, no, it's a leave, uh, vacation leave. I said, yes. He said, fine. 
<laughs> you can do anything, yeah, but I don't bring your money for you. So if you bring your own money, I don't care what you do. Really? The oceanography? I don't care. You can do anything you want. So I believe she's what? That's <laughs> why uh, I can. And uh, feels like. Join us! <laughs> wow, <laughs> that's great. <laughs> so now, we, so then we submit a proposal to NSF. Fortunately, we will be funded next three years. So my old dream came back. <laughs> now, now the um, midi work not wasted. <laughs> <laughs> so, uh, well, this is my story. But uh, I, I again thank you all of you. I'm from all the way, some come from. West Coast, <coughs> Canada, and uh, that's it for me. Thank you very much. It's been a, a wonderful two days. Uh, I want to thank you all for, for coming to help us celebrate this occasion. As I said yesterday, Akira, we look forward to many more years of your association with MSRC. As Professor Emeritus, you have your office. We hope and expect to see you in seminars. Akira asked some of the most insightful questions in seminars. In fact, Mary Scranton was telling me yesterday that when she applied for her job here, and she gave her job seminar, she was using some of Akira's uh, uh, formulae in, in her talk, and she didn't realize that he was in the audience, and, and Bob Wilson was behind, sitting behind Akira, pointing to him, <laughs> and uh, Mary said she, she believed she got the job because she didn't lose her cool, she, she uh, was able to handle his questions, and. Uh, so it's, it's just one example of, of the way Akira has interacted with us all. Um, let me also thank again the speakers and, uh, and the organizing uh, committee, uh, Simon Levin, Lita Proctor, and then here at the center, Malcolm Bowman, and uh, Jerry Shoup, Cliff Jones, Gina Garten, and uh, Lori Palmer. And I wish you all um, a good trip back. Uh, please come back to the center whenever you can to visit Akira. And uh, we look forward to seeing you again. Thanks a lot.